I've seen too many and talked to too many people who have signed on a lease in a location and a, a unit size that would never make them money, no matter how hard they tried and how well they did. You have to understand that some areas are better as an annual rental and some areas are better as an Airbnb. You need to understand that and do not sign a lease unless you understand that. This is episode number five, two of the Short Term Rental Success Stories podcast. Are you an investor that's looking to have your home professionally managed? Go to cohostit.com for more information. Welcome back to Short Term Rental Success Stories. I'm your host, Julian Sage. This is a show where I talk to hosts about their journeys in starting and growing their short term rental business. My goal is that you'll be able to walk away with practical information that'll help you become a better host and learn how to scale your business. Like any exceptional host, we all strive for five star reviews. So please go on over to iTunes and let us know what you enjoy as it really helps support the show. If you haven't done so already, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation, to connect with the community. Hey, what is going on, Host Nation? I am super excited to be back again with you this week. Thank you so much to everybody that joined John and I last week as we held our first live training on the 10 steps every host needs if you're going to be scaling a business on Airbnb using rental arbitrage and co-hosting. It was really, really powerful. It was so awesome to be able to cover the 10 steps. And from everybody that we heard that attended, they got so much value from that training Because really what we're doing is we're compressing everything that you need to know about Airbnb. Like this is something that I wish that I knew when I first started. And we compressed that into 10 steps and covered that. And then also gave everybody a checklist that they need that they can follow to build their own vacation rent machines. So if you're looking to start, automate and scale, that is a training that you need to be able to go to. But because of how powerful that training was, we really want to do this more often. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be hosting this live training uh, next week again. And we're going to be doing these trainings live as of now in anticipation of the VRM formula, which is John and I's program where we go over the 10 steps uh, more in depth. So we cover everything and give you all the tools and checklists. We have really cool bonuses that, you know, the people that were attending our training, they're like, oh my gosh, these bonuses are crazy because we give everything that we use in our own business. So again, if you do want to join that training, go to shorttermsage.com backslash early bird. This is going to be only for the early bird people that we're going to be doing this training live. Uh, We might do it live a few more times in the future, but right now is where you can talk to John and I, have your questions answered, cover anything that we covered in the training or ask any questions that you might have about the program. So really, really awesome. Again, go to shorttermsage.com backslash early bird to find out when the next live training will be. And this episode is really perfect timing because in this episode, I have the special honor of speaking with John Bianchi. John is a property manager that has around 10 properties right now, seven of them being rental arbitrage, three co-hosting, and majority of his units being in Chicago and Scottsdale, Arizona. John is also the founder of a new startup called Point Analytics, where it's a short-term rental uh, tool to be able to help you analyze markets. It's pretty unique, and I've gotten a, a look at it. I think John's on to something, and I'm excited to see where this tool turns out. And in John's story, he shares his experience of getting into the rental arbitrage space and the importance of analyzing and coming up with the numbers. I think that this is a really great episode because John walks us through his progress of, you know, finding out about rental arbitrage, trying to come up with the numbers and literally picking up his life and moving to new locations based off of what he thought was going to be a good market. Sometimes the numbers are not enough, though, and it's not until you really dive into the localities that you're able to find out if this is a profitable market or not. So in this episode, John talks about his entrepreneurial journey, about him hitting obstacles that he had to overcome, and he also talks about the risks involved in doing short-term rentals and shares some tips on how to avoid those. If you are going through market research in your journey and you're trying to find out where are those specific locations and what are the things that you should be looking for and how to work with investors, this is a really powerful episode. Of course, if you like my show notes for this episode, go to shorttermsage.com backslash str52. Or if you like my show notes sent directly to your inbox every week, then go to shorttermsage.com backslash show notes. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Hey, what is going on, Host Nation? And welcome to another episode of Short-Term Mental Success Stories. In this episode, I have the special, special honor of speaking with John Bianchi. John, would you please introduce yourself to the Host Nation and let them know who you are and what inspired you to get into short-term rentals? How's it going, everybody? My name is John Bianchi. Um, I'm a owner of Jaunt Stays. I uh, actually got into the Airbnb community because I read a lot of articles about people who were making a killing on Airbnb. Uh, literally Google searched and read articles over and over again about all these different people who figured out how they could make all this additional money on Airbnb. Uh, I thought it was a super cool way to make money, uh, sort of, you know, be able to, very scalable. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of... Um, 
not too much work for everything that was coming through, right? In comparison to other businesses that you can grow. So uh, plus Airbnb is such a dominant platform that it, that it brings in the marketing side for you, right? So you don't have to do too much on that end. Uh, anyway, so it seemed like a really great business model. Some good people were uh, doing it as well. And, and I decided that this was something I wanted to go for. So would you mind telling a little bit about how you got started into this business? Uh, you said that you were reading about some other people that uh, were making money, but um, where were you before this that led you into uh, getting into Airbnb? So before this, I was a uh, financial advisor, had my own financial advisor practice. I, I, I did that for about three and a half years. Uh, got to the point where I was uh, you know, partnered with a, an investor. I was managing uh, 10 million. He was managing 90 million. To be honest, you know, it was, it was a pretty good setup. I had my, whole, my name on the door, the whole the whole shebang. Um, but I just did not like the day to day, like whatsoever. And I and I thought about my life, uh, you know, twenty years from now, and I and I would have totally regretted it. Uh, Jeff Bezos always talks about future regret optimization. So you're you're optimizing your life to not have that future regret, right? And um, so I guess that was kind of in the back of my head as, as time was going. And in being in the financial world, you know, um, you have to learn all the numbers and all the, uh, how everything works. Um, and I, and I'm reading these articles, learning about all these of what these, these other people are doing. And I'm start running the numbers on it, right. To see like what was actually possible. And then I started understanding, like, there's a good amount, there's a good gap here where, uh, you know, if you have a home, you can actually make a good amount of money on an annual basis from home by home. Right. Um, and so I was like, this is, you know, if you have, if you have a good amount of these, you're doing pretty well. Right. So, um, I, I actually, from that I decided to then go and open up a, a, a home. And the first one I actually opened up was in Detroit, um, right on Woodward. The biggest mistake I ever made, by the way. So if I could, can I explain how bad, why that was such a bad mistake? Go for <laughs> okay? it. Go for it. Okay. So uh, didn't tell the, the condo association or the apartment association that I was going to be doing it because at that point I knew next to nothing. And I was just like, oh, they find out, you know, I'd be like, hey, let's go for it. I was working with somebody else at the time. We had a whole conversation. We were like, should we do it? And he, he goes, let's do it. And I was like, all right, let's go for it. Right. So we, anyways, we set it all up one month in, uh, we get an eviction letter, you know, time, time to get out. Luckily, uh, I, I met somebody who does corporate rentals. So they ended up renting it out corporately, uh, for the rest of the year, but I had no idea how to do that. So we were paying them to do that. And at the end of the year, we ended up making $800. Mind you, we made, we ended up losing money because of how much it costs for the furniture and everything. So terrible, terrible mistake. Also, looking back on it with the amount of research that I didn't do to open up that home, wouldn't have made us money regardless, right? Uh, but at the same time, so I opened up that one, and then I uh, about a month later opened up another one that was uh, in Gross Point, which is like uh, uh, 20 minutes away from downtown Detroit, a wealthier neighborhood. Same idea, two bedroom, one bath, would have never made me money over the full years. Terrible decision. I, I didn't really look into it. However, those two gave me a lot of uh, experience that allowed me to get to the next step. So, um, okay, should I go into the, the, the next step there? Yeah, what, yeah, what that, that did. Okay, just keep going. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So, so like I said, so uh, open up that one in Detroit, open up that one in Gross Point, and at that at this point, you know, still a financial advisor. Right? I was going back and forth. I actually uh, had to like leave the office multiple times just to go help there, things like that. So, so I'm going back and forth. Uh, I know I'm kind of headed on my way out of the the that business, um, but I wanted to before I could leave there, I had to make sure that I was secured enough. Uh, financially to be able to cover all my bills and continue to grow the business, right? So that was the, 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 the idea. And the homes that I had didn't give me that ability to do that. But what I did was I put together an entire business plan. I uh, called up my accountant friend who uh, put together financial projections of how well a business this business could do if you started to scale it. Then I used AirDNA to research every single possible location. Then I put together an entire business plan. And then I went and started talking to investors. And I had uh, two separate uh, groups of investors that were willing to lend me, uh, or, or sorry, not even lend, give me the money to own a portion of the company to go scale it. And so one was looking at giving me around 400,000. And then the other one was looking at giving me 250,000. Um, I ended up going with the people who were given 250,000 because I knew them, um, in a, in a different way. We, you know, you, you got, you got to click with the people that are giving you money. Right. So, so we, uh, we got along a lot better and, uh, it just made sense to go with these guys. Um, and so, I, I, I got the money from them. We secured the locations that we were going to go to. And, uh, and so I, I left the business behind. Like I, I sold off my portion of the business back to my uh, business partner and, and scraped my name off the door and took off, uh, essentially took off. Um, and I was ready to, to, to go and open them all. The, the funny thing is, is that we actually went down to Florida because we thought Florida was the best place to be. And if you look at the numbers and if you're just basing it off of the data and the numbers, 
it is a great location to be. However, this is the, the next lesson that I learned, which is regulation comes first. Regulation, you got to understand regulation, then look at the numbers, right? If you're not looking at regulation, you're going to, you're just screwing yourself. So I literally packed up my entire life and, and drove down to Florida, uh, got down to Florida and I was in this, the, the absolute best, uh, best city. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but anyways, it was the best, it was the best city. It's like number one beach in the world, right? Let's see. Uh, so Sarasota. Yes, uh, Siesta Key. Siesta Key. Siesta, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Key. I, I, yeah. I grew up in uh, Sarasota, so Siesta okay. Key is my okay. stomping grounds. Well, then you know. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I get down there, and then, and then when I start talking to people and going around, it turns out there's a, a zoning law that doesn't allow you to do Airbnb pretty well anywhere unless you're right. Like, I always like to explain it this way. If this was the entire city and county and everything, my the nail of my pinky finger is the only place where you're allowed to do Airbnb full-time. Everything else is illegal. Turns out almost every city along the East Coast of Florida operates the exact same way. So if you're not purchasing, then you can't do it. And the thing is, is that Florida has been a, a travel destination forever. Anyways, so I spent a month um, driving from city to city to city. So I went, uh, I did, I did Siesta Key, then whichever is just north of that. And then I ended up in, in Tampa uh, and the St. Petersburg. And then it was Clearwater. Had this whole grand plan for Clearwater. I still can't believe I did this all in one month. I think about it. So, and then Clearwater. And then I got to the point where I was like, no, nothing. Like, there's nothing here. The next thing would have been I had to go all the way down to Fort uh, Lauderdale. My, uh, my ex girlfriend lived there, so I didn't want to do that. <laughs> and so I was like, uh, no, we're not going, we're not going there. Um, anyways, but uh, I was like, so the next thing was, was Miami. Um, and so then I, I, I drove all the way over to Miami and then I, I tried figuring out Miami as well. Like, so, you know, the, the numbers are amazing there, but it's really only for South Beach, right? And then even when you're in South Beach, like it's next to impossible in South Beach. Anyways, the best places if you're in Florida, by the way, West Palm, uh, Hollywood, Fort Lauderdale, those places allow it. That was actually where I stopped and gave up, which is, it's funny how, uh, you know, everyone talks about when you're like, uh, when you give up, you're usually about like two, two inches away from success. I literally went all the way around Florida and stopped at Hollywood where Fort Lauderdale allows it and is very, uh, very successful. And uh, West Palm is the same thing. And I stopped right before and drove all the way back because I was like, it's not working. So anyways, um, so, that, that thing is true. So just to kind of recap your, your story is um, you had this financial business, you were, you know, you were doing well with it, but uh, you, you saw that, that your, your room that you're renting out was making a whole lot of money. Uh, you decided to basically um, you know, scale this up by picking up a unit, but you found out, you know, regulations, uh, it was, was a little bit troubling. Um, and then, uh, you, you were able to acquire a, a good lump sum of money from some investors that were going to get into this, uh, rental arbitrage space. But then you decided, uh, so you decided to leave the job. Then you just went on an, another tour around Florida, trying to find the perfect locations because you were utilizing this data. And the data, if you're just looking at the data, it's showing it's you know hot hot spots, you know Florida, Miami, all these things. But um, what people don't realize is it just numbers itself isn't doesn't dictate if you're going to be able to have a profitable business. So um, you decided to head up back north. Uh, so what what was kind of the next step in your 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 progression? Okay, so. Uh, you know, I, I talked to these investors and, and secured this money. And then all of a sudden, after a month, I realized I, I didn't know one of the most important things. Right. And so, uh, felt that was, that was tough. Right. That was real tough, but it, it really drove me into this mo mode of like, I need to find a solution and I only have so much time. Otherwise this isn't going to, I, you know, it's not going to work. And I just gave up my entire business <laughs> that it took me a while to quite a bit to grow. Um, so uh, so what I did was I just went back to the numbers and then when I went back to the numbers, I also went back to, uh, I, I tried to find good locations, but then I also looked for what areas allowed it. Right. So, so then I went because I essentially, uh, would go anywhere in the United States. That's the way I was operating. I was like, I'm going to go anywhere. It doesn't matter. Right. So what I did was I started reading the regulation for all the different major cities where it's, you know, most profitable. Um, and Chicago was actually one of the places that had put regulation in place but there was still room to play. So that, that's the thing. So uh, people like the other best option would have been San Diego, which sounds like a way better option than Chicago. If you think about it. However, the reason I didn't want to go for it was because I didn't have any regulation in place. So I didn't want to go all the way down to San Diego, put all of this money into uh, these investors money into all these homes. And then they pass a, a law and it all gets changed. And the, the, they did pass a law 
a year later uh, from the day that I made that decision. However, 60,000 people signed a petition to have it turned over and it got turned over and they still don't have anything right now. However, so, but uh, anyway, so Chicago was the safer, smarter, with other people's money bet to make. Um, and so then I just learned about Chicago left, right, and center and tried to understand absolutely everything that I could using the numbers, the data, because uh, like I said, I didn't do that for the first two homes. But to, to raise money, I really needed to do that. And so I got more and more and more and more into it. Uh, and, and so I understood what were the good areas, what were not the good areas, where I could put money. And we're doing rental arbitrage model at this point, right? So when you're doing rental arbitrage model, uh, your expenses are X through the entire year. You have to make more than that, you know? Um, and so I had to make sure that I was getting these right locations. So I put a lot of research into it before we could ever. Uh, so anyways, I ended up going to Chicago. Um, within the first eight days that I was there, uh, I secured three locations, um, all in a general, same sort of general area, uh, that, uh, I still have now, uh, to stay except for one actually, uh, because we got rid of that. So, but, uh, so the first month I got there or sorry, first eight days had three, uh, within a month and a half, all three of those were set up. Uh, we, I ended up getting another one during that same time period. So we had four within a month and a half. Um, by the end of the summer, we had five. Uh, all rental arbitrage again. Um, and then by uh, October, we opened up two more locations. And this is another huge lesson that I learned. Rental arbitrage and Airbnb, you need to understand cash flow and seasonality better than anything ever, ever. You just need to understand, you should always have, what's my absolute worst month? Those are my expenses. Not nothing, not medium month, not you know best month, just absolute worst. And I mentioned that because we used the money. So the money that we used to open up those first five locations generated so much money in, in four months that we were able to open up another two locations just from the money that was earned. Right. So it's like, that's that, you know, we're, we're on a high. We're like, this is amazing. <laughs> Let's just keep popping these things open. And then, uh, we actually drained the account so low that when the, uh, um, winter came, I had to go to the investors and say like, we're short, like for four months, the, the down season in, in uh, uh, Chicago is four months, right? The up season is it's strong six, uh, even two, down four. So for four months, I had each, at the end of each month, I had to get about 10,000 or more uh, from the investors to, to float us through to get back to that, that, that summer. You know that, that that's pretty that's pretty in interesting, John. And I I love how how numbers driven you are. Um, you know, like because when when you're when you're talking about investors and money, um, it having those those numbers, having those figures is so important. So like you know, with with us, we have we have this thing we call the turnkey arbitrage program, and you know the same same deal. You have those high seasons during those those like six or eight months. Then you have those two more neutral months, and then you also have those those slow months. People don't realize that it's not green all year round, you know. And when you're talking with investors and you're saying, "Oh, this is a profitable business," you also have to tell them you could be breaking even or you could be losing money. You might have to pull some money out of your pocket to be able to keep the business afloat. And a lot of people are just thinking when they start, and maybe they're starting at the tail end of like that high season. And they're just like, man, I'm making all this money. I'm doing really good. And now I'm not doing anything. What's, what's wrong. Right. Yeah. Big and time. So you had these investors and you, you, you had, you took the cash flow that you're using, pick up more units, but now you have all these units and you also have a slow season that's, that's coming up. How, how did you get through that? Uh, a lot of stress, <laughs> a lot of stress, but a lot of, uh, uh, actually, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to shout out, um, Danny with Optimize My BNB saved, absolutely saved my, I think it saved my business because uh, his book there that he has, which is $25 and has made me thousands, um, it teaches you every single last thing that you can do to bring in more people, to, to optimize your listing, to you know change this, change that. And uh, it, it's like this, it's like search engine optimization for Google, for, Air, for Airbnb. And then if you can understand all these different things, then it, it, it helps you stay afloat. You know what I mean? It helps you keep those things coming in. And he even says it the best. Uh, the winter separates the, the good host from the bad host. Or the, the, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's what he says. And it's, it 100% is true, right? Um, and so, and the thing is, is it's, it's funny because like nowadays, we, we're so strict with our optimizing our revenue. Like it's, it's very consistent. We have a, a, such a strong process to go about it. But before I read that book, we'd been operating for like half a year without ever even touching those numbers are, are trying to make sense of it. Right. And, uh, so to get through the winter, uh, I really had to learn 
every trick that there was to this business and, and make sure that I was implementing them. Um, and then on top of that, track when every single dollar was going to be coming out and when every dollar was going to come in and, and project what dollars were going to come in at that time period. And then um, when we got to a certain time, it's like, okay, we need this amount, right? Like this is, this is the amount we need. Luckily, we got uh, one of my favorite texts from the investors was uh, at the around between uh, Christmas and New Year's. Because of those, because of Christmas and New Year's, there there was a jump that I wasn't expecting, right? And so I was expecting to have to ask them for about you know another ten, like another ten grand come through, right? Um, and I, I didn't end up meeting it. And they're like, "That's the best. This is the best text that I've received. <laughs> All Chris, best Christmas gift you gave me." Um, anyway, so so, but uh, it, it was just a matter of of. I think you said it best. So just understanding the numbers will not make you a successful host. Understanding the numbers will help you select the right home, right? And the right area. Um, however, you also need to know regulation first, then you get the right home, then you learn how to do the, run the business, right? And optimize it and make sure that everything is a well-oiled machine and coming through. Um, and then once you understand that part there, it's like, there, you're, you're pretty well set, right? Like other than, uh, uh, you know, bookkeeping, you're, you're just, you're, you're good to go. Like you've almost said every, everything actually, maybe I'll run into something that I don't know yet. <laughs> so, so you were scaling up these units, um, in the Chicago area and you were playing within the regulations, which, um, is also a pretty, pretty smart move. Uh, we've talked to some other hosts that, that play within the Chicago and is, is, you know, a lot of people say Chicago, you know, it's, it's regulated. I can't do the business here. How are people able to make money? But, uh, the, the, the smart hosts are able to play within the regulations, uh, you know, and to keep things afloat. But uh, you decided to expand operations a little bit. Do you mind telling about that and what you had going on when you decided to move? Uh, are you referring to Scottsdale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the Scottsdale decision was actually not until like a year, 20. So it was, it was like the following summer that we had made it. So we had been open for a little over a year. Uh, and and it was it, the, the idea being was, you know, there was, so the regulation uh, does hold you back in Chicago, right? Uh, then the seasonality also holds you back and Scottsdale, uh, Arizona, like, so Arizona, the state state allows, um, Airbnb through the entire state. Um, and so I was like, that, you know, that's a great spot to go. So I started doing all the research there. Scottsdale is like one of the most profitable areas you can be. And, uh, so I you know, ran all the numbers, trying to figure out what the best spot, spot was. And the other nice part about it is it's the exact opposite season of Chicago, right? So, um, you know, we, we only have one location down there right now. Realistically, we're going to end up, uh, and increasing that a number, right? Because, because they are perfect opposite, opposite season. So like right now, like this month, uh, February, right? Like we're going to be, we're going to lose like uh, 10 to 15,000 ish dollars. Right. But uh, the one home that we have in Scottsdale is going to make like seven to $8,000 net. you know, right. So that, that money is going to go directly in, you know, to help offset that. And that's just one, right? So if we have multiple there, then the, the, it'll be, uh, it'll actually help us level out our cash flow as we, as we grow. So it was a, it's a decision that made sense um, when, it, when you looked at the numbers, when you looked at the regulation. Uh, I, I opened it up. I was in Chicago and I made phone calls to random people down in Scottsdale to open the home up. I, I swear to God, I never went there until uh, like a month and a half ago. And we opened it up uh, in, in, in like uh, August. And so I hadn't gone there until like December. Um, and so, but I just made, anyways, I made, I made random phone, I made phone calls connect with a handyman, a realtor, um, a, a cleaning company, a photographer just, and said like, I need you to do this. I need you to do this. I need you. To, and they, and they all did it. And so, uh, yeah. So you, you were, you were able to, you said you picked up, uh, three, uh, how many properties did you pick up in Scottsdale initially? Uh, initially two, initially two, and so you initially did this two. all remotely just by utilizing other teams. Um, yeah. don't recommend that by the way. But, and why not? Uh, from my, so, okay, wait, with my experience now, I guess, I guess I could go for it. Right off the bat, it was it it, it uh, didn't help. So the one home went well. Okay, so the one one home went well. Um, however, like the the initial marketing of it uh, was not nearly as high as the standards that I wanted to be. So it was, it was really difficult to communicate to the people setting things up exactly like like the little things, right? Like the where certain plants should go and why those plants go there, and like you know the all that kind of stuff. And then uh, explain to the photographer like how to get this absolute best photo shoot, right? And I I put together like a a um, a slide, uh, a presentation that says how to shoot every single room. And I've got like 40 of these slides and it's perfectly laid out, but it just still didn't come through properly. Right. Um, so anyways, but, the, but that first home was, it was, it was pretty good. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible how it worked out. The second home, 
Um, actually, so this is a like a warning to people when it comes to rental arbitrage. So I'm just going to throw a warning out there. Uh, the rental arbitrage model, the, the profit margins are somewhere around 15 to 20 percent, right? Uh, per home by home basis. So when you grow, when you're cert- sitting at a certain number, right, of homes, uh, one bad home can can really hurt almost the entire business. Where if you continue to get past, you know, grow and grow and grow, you have so many homes that one home won't affect the majority, right? It'll affect, you know, your cash flow and some of them, but it's not going to affect the entire business. That, that's true for any business, right? If you actually listen to podcasts with, um, uh, what's that grocery store that everyone loves? The Whole, Fo- Whole Foods. Um, he, he said when he was building Whole Foods, every single store he opened uh, from the first few years, uh, put, he put the entire business in, in jeopardy, right? Because if, if one of those stores failed, his entire business is going to fall apart. And that's just how business works when you take on these expenses, right? If it all comes crashing down. So the reason I'm explaining all this is because the second home that we got in Scottsdale, the realtor told me there was five bedrooms when there was actually four. Um, the, the landlord was a, um, had some drug issues uh, and that led to him not, and money issues. And so he didn't take care of any of the lawn. He never took care of the pool. So guests would show up and the pool was green Right. And so they, then they would just request their money back. Uh, we started in the, the slower season. And then also we just had um, the, the way that the home was set. Once again, the photographer, right. Didn't set the home up, home up uh, didn't photo shoot properly. So we didn't have the right marketing. We didn't have somebody taking care of the landlord, taking care of the things that he was supposed to take care of. The, the home was different than we are num- like, cause I was projecting a five bedroom compared to a four bedroom way different, right. There's, there's huge numbers difference there. And, and so that hurt us uh, cause we took on a rent that was higher than it should have been. Anyways, that, uh, so, so that, and, and then the regulation ended up changing before we got into the high season. So the, the neighbors all changed the regulation for that home. It wasn't an HOA area. It was in a, a, an area that was a CCNR. They changed the regulation before we could hit the peak season to make all the money back that we had lost. And so we had just lost it. That's it. We had no way of, of getting it back. So it was, that's the risk we take though. Right. So, so it, that doesn't you know that 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 that's pretty that's pretty wild that that whole story and one of the things that really kind of stuck out was that whole CCNR. Um, do you, do you mind how how do, how does that how does that even work? Because Scottsdale, you know, a lot of people and I love what you said about the the counter seasons. Uh, that that's one of the strategies that professional uh you know professional rental arbitrage hosts that they try to implement. You know, uh, is you have all of your you know if all your properties are in Chicago and then it's in the slow season, you know, you're going to be hurting during that time. So you counter that with, uh, you know, um, locations that are, you know, counter to that. Um, so that, that's really smart of you. Uh, but with the whole regulation thing about the CCNR that, that kind of throws a wrench in in things. Can you kind of explain what that is? And, uh, is that something that hosts should be concerned about and how do you prevent something like that from happening? Uh, yeah. So, okay. Um, now, mind you, I know what I know from it, but I don't know everything. So I'll give the, the, my understanding, okay? Um, a little disclaimer. So in Arizona, the entire state's allowed to do Airbnb. It, everyone knows that, well, everyone should know as an, as an Airbnb host, never go into an area that has an HOA, right? Because almost, unless the HOA says you're allowed to do it, then run to there, okay? But, if they, but they almost say don't, no one's allowed to do short-term rental. Um, so everyone stays away from there. However, groupings of homes um, still have a sort of agreement, I guess you could say, for neighborhoods. At least that's what it is in Scottsdale. They have this, this, this agreement within certain homes. So this was 63 or 68 homes um, within this area. They all had this different, it, it, it's not like, a, it's not HOA. It's just like, it, it's a little bit different. It's kind of like, you know, put your garbage out on Tuesdays, right? Don't let your, so it's those kind of things. Um, but in there, there's something called a CC and andr right uh and and that you can change to not allow uh short-term rentals within those 68 homes and so it essentially becomes like an hoa where they're saying you can't do it and then they can find you through the city for every time you do it so they can they can now uh, essentially shut you down overnight right because once you start getting those fines like you can't cover the bills. Like that's just, that, that's what happens. So we, we never got the fine, but we, uh, we shut down before then, obviously. Right. Uh, now. So anyway, so that is, that's, that's my understanding of a CCNR. Um, there, there, I, I think they would even like, so if I, if you take that logic, right. Of like, 
that's just how it is for there. That, that that's most likely the same case for every city. I'm assuming, right? That they there is some sort of neighborhood agreement um, it, when you buy a home, right? And so I'm assuming that that is something that everybody should sort of understand and know could be a possibility. The thing is, it's like one person. So one person has to rally the troops, essentially uh, get a majority vote on on it, and then they have to all sign off on it, right? So you really need like a somebody who was who's in the neighborhood who goes door to door knocking to make this it's not like because with HOAs there's there's like a few people who are in charge they have their meetings um they make decisions and they they let everyone know what's happening and if everyone disagrees then they can do it but anyway so it's a little bit different uh it's more rare because you really gotta someone's really got to push for it that's kind of scary though because you know if if people just automatically uh know that Scottsdale is, is kind of one of those areas where you can but then there's little pockets you know, how would you even find out if you were to, you know, uh, do this, uh, that, that that's something that, you know, that they've implemented in that one specific area? The landlord will know. So the landlord will know. Um, they all, all the landlords, uh, it's like our, our landlord received a letter in the mail saying like, this is the change to our CCNR, right? Or, or the CCNR change. I'm not sure. So I don't even know if it's an entire thing or just a, a subsection. Uh, but anyway, so. Okay. And and I'd say just google it, you know, try to learn a little bit more. So so, you know, uh, you, you've really you've really had John, your your story is really interesting. You you you've you've done a uh you've been all around Florida, you've you've done all the different regulations. Uh so so where did where did you take uh, take the business next um after the Scottsdale incident? Uh so I tried two different things uh sort of around like before Scottsdale after Scottsdale. Uh, around the same sort of time, I always wanted to take the business to the next level, right? So in my head, I was like, okay, this makes sense, but it makes sense at scale, right? And, and I understood that. And I saw companies like Sonder and Domio, I saw what they were doing. And I was like, okay, if they're doing it, we could do it, right? Um, if there's got to be a way to, to actually make this happen, right? Like, so Sonder raised 300 million so far. If I have the right systems in place and the data and the information, like, why can't I do the same thing, right? Um, and so what ended up happening was, uh, I had another person, so I started off on my own with the investors. Then I, I started working with another guy, and then there was a uh, sort of a, a mentor, I guess you could say, that I had had from back home, who, who was an older guy, and he he actually owned three different marijuana companies because in Canada it's, it was legal, and so the he had these three different marijuana companies that uh, brought him a good amount of money. And, and so what he did was he was sort of our connector, right? Like he worked with us, and he put us in contact with people that he needed to make these things happen, and um, and so. What he wanted to wanted us to do was was to push right, like like become a Sonder. Well, I wanted to become like a Sonder, and he 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 saw that vision, and so he knew how to how to make that reality because that's what he had done his entire life was like build companies up like that. Um, and so we actually got to a point where we had a turn twelve to open up two hundred locations in I think we're going to do Chicago and New Orleans. Like that was the the, t- the two areas that made the most sense. Um, and we were going through the due diligence process of all this. Now, mind you, this isn't like a this isn't exactly like the term sheets that you hear about for the uh, San Francisco. It's a little bit different of a term sheet, but it was it was a uh, the potential to move forward. Like they they saw the opportunity, right? It was like okay, well, this is real, right? Uh, because actually, like a hotel in a hotel costs a crazy amount of money to open, and it takes like twenty five years to make their money back. And then they saw what our uh, what how our business was structured, and they were like, you can make the money back in like two years, you know, like year two. Like they it was just like. So mind-boggling to them. They're like, "How, right?" Um, so they they jumped on it quickly. Uh, anyways, what ended up happening was uh, the marijuana license um, got approved in Canada, so it's it fully recreational legal. Uh, that propelled the, this guy's business like significantly, um, it, which means we had no time for us whatsoever. Uh, he just he just you know three of the businesses couldn't go for it. Uh, my, the, the other guy I was working with at the same time, uh, had a change of heart and, and wanted to do a different career. He was more of a, not, not, not that, uh, this isn't a bad way of saying it, but it's truly what it is like a tree hugger, right? Like that's, that's who he was. He was more of a hippie at heart. And like, that's what he wanted. You know, he's living in Thailand right now with his fiance and they're just, they're, they're loving life. Right. Um, but, and, and so it, it was, everything collapsed, uh, let's say, right. So everything that we were working towards fell apart, uh, fairly, fairly quickly, like with actually within like a two week period. Um, and, and we had put so much work in to get to this point. We stopped opening homes just so we could work on all the operations to get them to the point. We were working with consultants. We were working like, anyway, so we did all that and it, it, it essentially 
fell apart. And so it, I had the decision, do I stop? Do I keep going? And obviously I kept going, right? Um, wasn't going to let it fall apart. And I just started moving again. And actually that's sort of around the time where, where Scottsdale stepped in a little bit actually was, was, uh, saw the opportunity there, uh, wanted to keep open up more locations, things like that. And I was like, let's do an, something a little bit different, right? Let's not just keep going to Chicago. And so that's, that's where that really played into. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, you, you, you've had such, such an entrepreneurial journey and I think it's really interesting though. Uh, this, this space is so new and, uh, it, it, this space is so new and there's, there's, you know, like like you were saying, there, there's there's these established businesses, the, the hotel companies, and they've been doing this for years. But they also have you know an ROI, and their time frame is is a bit longer. For for us in this space, you know, we can see these returns really really quickly. Um, but man, you've just been hitting obstacle and obstacle. Um, did you decide? So did you decide to keep on going the arbitrage model, um, or did you decide to kind of divert your attention at that point? Different pivot. So. Uh... Uh, I thought it would be a good idea to, 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 to change in the route that we had gone. Uh, one of the actually sort of nail in the coffin decisions for that was when Airbnb invested $160 million into Lyric, uh, which is another Sonder, another Domeo, uh, Stay Alfred. Like they, so, so I was like, okay, these guys are all... The worst thing you can do is start a business where there's that much competition. You know what I mean? Like everyone recommends do not get into a business where and, and try and grow at that, at that scale where it's just... Because you, your margins are going to be ridiculous, right? If you ever look at like a hotel industry, their margins are like 10%, right? They're making a lot of money, but their margins are 10%. But if you look at like Facebook, you know, those kind of businesses, they're, they're, their margins are insane. And that's where the, those monies are really coming in. So um, I decided to pivot to something that would, would be more along the lines of a, a technology type company that had the, where it wasn't really infrastructure, like I wasn't uh, owning the homes, I wasn't managing the homes, but I was like, I was giving the ability for everyone to uh, control, right? Um, I, I, the way I saw it was that I, I had the systems down pat. I had the operations down pat. We had to build them all up to, to take on that money. Uh, and we were marketing properly. It's like, okay, we've got something that's, that's working. Uh, let's package it and, and make it into a good system that other people can just easily implement and grow. Right. So franchise model. Um, but not just the typical franchise, like subway type model, where you're throwing the you know, systems and the name on the board. It was like technology type process. Uh, and it was actually a company from China is doing something very similar to this. And I realized uh, how they were doing it too. Uh, and, I, and, and I learned their business model a little bit more, a little bit better, like short term. So, and, and then uh, essentially the idea is that you're, you're franchising them, right? So you're allowing for other hosts to do everything that you do under your brand name and you take a percentage of that. Okay. So, uh, and, and they can list through your platform as you continue to grow. And like, now it's like, it's like short term rentals, individual hosts, but standards. And, and, and strong operations, right? So no law, the, our whole thing was we wanted to uh, uh, get rid of the idea of going to an Airbnb and not knowing what you're going to get, right? So uh, having to fear getting a bad experience, having to fear that the beds weren't going to be made. Like we wanted to create a way to get rid of that and be known for like these premium, not even just like a regular home, but well, well kept, right? Um, and so no, long, no longer have those bad experiences. So like, that's what we wanted to implement and use the technology to be able to scale it, uh, properly. And what happened was like, we I did the MVP type model and I continued to, uh, work on it, learn it, understand it. Uh, I started, you know, at one point I like CFO was working with, a uh, uh, C, uh, CEO who was also, uh, we're helping us there too. And we, we started to move it and we were, I was working with different franchise, uh, people who are going to be franchisees that I was going to learn from them and how to bring it together. Uh, and I, honest to God, I just stopped. I just did, just was like, this isn't the where the route that I want to go to the day that I die. And once again, future regret optimization. I got deep enough into it that I was like, could this isn't how I want to go for another 20, 20 years. And uh, I, I obviously, you know, maybe maybe it's my fear of just continuing to grow and getting to that size. Um, and and some people will, you know, will probably assess that and be like, well, he just didn't want to continue, and he's using that as, as an excuse and Sometimes I contemplate that myself, right? Like, but, uh, but anyway, so I, I stopped the motors on that one. And now what we do is now we're just continuing on the, uh, uh, rental arbitrage and property management side with a heavier focus on property management, uh, because of the, the cash flow of property management, the profit margins, of property management, we have a creating company in there as well. And, and, uh, you know, we use all the data and research that we possibly can to make sure that everything comes together. What type of data? Um, because we, when we were talking before, and you know, I, I, maybe we can get you on another show um, when uh, to talk more about this 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 thing that you have 
uh, currently uh, that should be released pretty soon. Uh, but you're, you're very data driven and you're working with all these investors. Uh, you decide you're also taking on co-host properties. Uh, but when you're analyzing these deals, what type of information do you really need to look for? Uh, because you, you were saying that some of the information from AirDNA, like if you're just going off of AirDNA, uh, you know, places like um, you know, Florida would make sense. You know, they don't tell you about the regulations, uh, but you know, just off the numbers, it, it makes sense until you start going there. And then you realize that, you know, it's not maybe exactly what you thought it was going to be. So what, what type of information do you need if you're going to be partnering or working with investors or uh, co-host clients in a property management business? So if you go online, if you Google a regulation for a city, right, it's almost always going to be there. If you go to the city hall, you can find it. If you call up the city hall, you can, you can get that information, right? Uh, I always tell people that's step one. So all, just figure out the regulation because that's, that's going to hurt you. Make sure you're not an HOA. Understand what an HOA is, right? Uh, the CCNR scenario, not much you can do there. Just risk it, I would say, honest to God. Um, but uh, uh, when it comes to the data, there, there's really only one company that's out there that's any bit good at it right now, which is AirDNA. Uh, almost everyone knows about AirDNA. There's Mash Pfizer. But I, if you ever try using that, it's like, it's terrible. It's a terrible site. It's not very, it's not helpful at all. So, uh, but AirDNA just gives you all the information. Okay. So they just like, here's everything. Um, they have a cheap version, which gives you a bunch of information that I don't find useful whatsoever. They're like, here's the average daily rate. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? Right. That doesn't help me price my home. That doesn't, uh, there's, there's very little calculations that I can actually use to make that happen. Um, but then the other thing too, is like they, they have issues with their algorithm, which is a, a part that I left out of my story, but, uh, I'll, I'll tell it real quick. Um, I use their data to, to, to figure out, uh, Ann Arbor, which is a, a city in Michigan, you know, Michigan university, that's, that's where they are in Ann Arbor. Uh, and I, I, it, it, air DNA's data showed that there were a lot of homes that were doing like crazy numbers, like 150,000, 200,000, which didn't really make a lot of sense. But I was like, well, maybe it's really close to school. There are these big homes. I'm like, you know, I, I logic it to make it make sense. Um, but after doing more research into it, what I realized was just an issue, a, a, an issue with their algorithm. Um, there's, there's seven massive football games that happen every single year. Okay. And so, uh, in that city, and what happens is all these major homes that are directly beside the stadium, they just leave for the weekend and rent out the home for like four grand for the weekend, right? Five grand for the weekend. And so but what happens is that they, they just have that available. And as soon as that, uh, gets booked, air DNA assumes that all these other days, are, are booking out around the exact same time, but really they're all blocked, right? And so what happens is AirDNA is saying that they're making $150,000, but really they're just making like four grand a weekend for seven weekends. And so I actually uh, was was like about to sign a $7,000 lease uh, on a on a absolutely beautiful home that was steps away from the stadium. Like it was gonna be amazing. Like the numbers on it were amazing. Realize that the, the, the whole algorithm, everything is just completely off, right? So you really need to, um, like with the data, you need to, to, to look into it, right? You need to find the averages within it, track as much information as you can to sort it out, right? Uh, and put it together and then make sure that these listings that they're showing you are actually doing what they're saying to do, right? They, like go into the listing and like read through the calendar. Like if, it, if, if, a, if a listing's doing $200,000 a year and it has five reviews, it's not doing $200,000 a year, right? Like that's just how it is. You have to, but like you don't know that unless you, really, really get into the nitty gritty stuff of it. Right. So, um, and that took time that took practice and I like finally figured all of this out and, and, and got to that point. So, uh, but, but if you're, if you're, so my advice, if you're going to use air DNA, uh, they do have the market minder, which is nice and cheap and you can, you can, you know, hundred bucks for a city for per month and it's, you can cancel whenever gives you all the different locations. You can break it down, just start recording that stuff and see if you can find an average, right. See if you can find something that that's common, um, that, and, and then run the numbers backwards on it. So if it's a hundred thousand, what are all, what are all my expenses? What am I left with? Right. Um, then there's the other option was, which is the investor, ex, uh, investment explorer, uh, which gives you the entire country and gives you every single last thing. That one takes a lot of work because it's just, here's all the information. It's well put together, like, well, easy to navigate. Uh, but it's just all there. Like everything is there. And so you really got to just sort through step by step by step. Um, and then the, the last option is the, uh, enterprise option, which, which is where they just give you a, uh, a spreadsheet with every single listing that's ever been purchased. We, we just got, uh, uh, New York and has 238,000 lines, 238,000 lines with every single line is an Airbnb that's ever operated in, in New York since 2008, 238, put that in perspective, Chicago had 38,000 lines. Um, and anyway, so we, we sort that data out, uh, and we went from actually in, in Chicago, went from 38,000 lines to 900. 
And the, out of those 900s were the only ones that we actually ended up keeping and, and, and uh, using as this is what we want. Uh, the, the best way to explain it is the Burger King logic. So uh, back in the day, this has been a logic for like 40 years. So um, McDonald's puts millions of dollars into their, their research to figure out what's the absolute best corner to be on. And then they open up a store there and then Burger King opens a cup up across the street, right? Because Burger King knows they're there. It's going to be good for us too, right? So what you want to do is you want to say, okay, this guy's done it. And this is how well he's done. We can do that, right? Or we can do that better. So that's, uh, that's my take on, on data. So whenever you're analyzing a market, you're looking at uh, who's, who's the, you know, versus regulations versus, you know, HOA, got to make sure that you can do this. Uh, but then next is you're looking for uh, the McDonald's, like who are the people that are bringing yeah. in the money? Once you have right. that information, you're going into the listing and you're finding, you know, is what they're saying makes sense throughout the span of the year or is it right. just during a particular season? Because Air, Air DNA is just going to tell you, hey, this is what it is throughout the whole, you know, throughout the whole year uh, based off of maybe only a certain season. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah. so what you're doing is you're, you're just looking at it across. Um, okay. And then, but when you're working with an investor um, and you're right. trying to give them hard numbers, I mean, these are people that are throwing out big numbers like this. How do you, how do you collect that information? Like how, how, you know, if, if you're trying to be there like Sonder, you know, what information do you need to present to someone uh, if you're only given, you know, kind of like this half data and there's this amount of data that you have to kind of manually scrape? You just got to manually scrape you like it, it, that. You know what I mean? Like you got to put in the work to, to literally scrape it. Like that's, that's what I did. I, uh, you know, you, you have the information, the information's all there, but you got to take that information and compile it into something that makes sense. Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I obviously I've talked a lot about it right now through my experience. I've uh, been able to learn more and more about how to put these sort of things together, but I, I did it by watching, uh, by learning from a, a friend who's an accountant, right? Or uh, watching YouTube videos or like learning about these different things. Like what is a financial report that an investor wants to see? Like what are they, what are they looking for, right? Uh, what numbers matter uh, mostly to them? And how can I show that to them to make sure that they understand what, what is there? Um, and if you're saying like you just have half data and there's a lot of like manual scraping that needs to go down, uh, if, if AirDNA is the only option, we'll talk about something later, but if AirDNA is the only option, then you have to manually scrape and get to, the, the, these McDonald's is right McDonald's and and then be able to take that information and plug it into a financial report and break everything down for an investor so I'm not gonna try to explain you know every single way to put together a financial report because because Google will it, YouTube will do a much better job right but there's that's just essentially it you just take the numbers you work backwards and and uh, you know there's a lot of courses out there and a lot of uh, articles that'll just teach you what are, what's every single expense you need to consider right how much uh, so here's one thing that people miss, um, the cleaning fee. Okay. So if you have an Airbnb and there's a cleaning fee, the thing that people miss is they assume what the cleaning fee is before they even know what it is. So, uh, they'll say like, Oh, the cleaning fee is going to be a thousand dollars a month. Well, no, maybe it's not, maybe it's 800, maybe it's 2000, right? Some places it's more expensive. A clean can be $50 in one city, uh, and 150 in another city, right? Scottsdale, it's like $200, $225 a clean, right? That's a lot of money that's coming out. Uh, here in Chicago, for the exact same size home, it's 125. So 100 dollar difference. When you're doing eight cleans a month, that's 800 dollar difference in revenue, right? So you you got to just like figure out what it, what are the actual numbers and do the research. Just every line, do the research on the line. Like put put in that work. And the only way you're ever going to close an investor is if you put in the work. If you can sit there and and show how much work you put into every single last thing. If you don't, if you if you didn't do that. The investor is going to be able to see it. They're going to be able to understand. And they're not going to give you, not going to give you the money for a home. And also, a landlord's not going to give you his home to property manage. Right? It's simple as that. So, uh, that's that's my take. Yeah. And and at which point did you? Are you still going the arbitrage model, or at which point did you say that you wanted to start uh, focusing on the property management uh, more? Uh, it happened after the home in Scottsdale that fell apart, uh, because like I had mentioned, you know. It, one home at, at a certain size of business can really pull you, take you down. So what, um, so, so what we did was, um, that, that actually, we almost went broke twice. So the first time was the first winter. The second time was the second winter, <laughs> right? Those slow season kill you. The first, the, the first season, uh, the issue was 
um, that we opened up homes right before the season. We didn't understand our cash flow. The second issue was that we had a home that tore apart our bank account, right? The rent on that home, by the way, was $4,500, just the rent, right? Um, now, obviously, we're, we're, we're doing okay through the winter and things like that, but, but it, it, when that's pulling at you, right, uh, that hurts. And so, so we going through this winter, like, you know, we're, we're realizing like we need to increase these profit margins. And the best way to possibly do that is to use this property management model mixed in with our rental arbitrage model. And then, and, and you combine these two and it, it just allowed like cash flows, everything, right? So if you don't have that cash flow, especially with the seasonality, you, like you're going to be screwed. So our whole plan right now is by that time we hit winter three, our home, like we're going to, we're, we're not even going to be worried at all, right? Like we're going to get through winter three without a single worry because of how well we're going to push through everything, watch every single dollar comes through and, and make sure our profit margins and cash flows and significantly increase in reserves and all those things down the line. Um, so, however, when you know the numbers, there are certain homes you have to do as rental arbitrage. There are certain homes you would never want to give up and to a landlord. So I have one home as an example that uh, makes me $50,000 uh, on an annual basis net. Okay. Um, that's one home net 50,000. So it makes $120,000 a year. And my expenses are 70,000 on it. If I did it as a property management model, I would be making 20,000. A little over twenty thousand. But still, on this, I'm making twenty thousand. Yeah, is still <laughs> good. But I'm going to take the risk to double that money, right? My risk is next to none, other than the furniture I got to get into the home. But it's just, you know, it's the same size home as some of my other lo uh, locations. It's just in a significantly better location. And so I have, I have two of those: one that's doing fifty, one that's doing forty. And I don't want the landlords to to switch to property management. Simple as that, right? Like I just don't want them to. So whenever I find one of those guys, I'll set that up as property management all day long. All day long, John. I I love it. I love I love, I love what you said uh, because that's that's the model that that um that we we utilize as well. And I, I I encourage people because a lot of people come into this space and they just think you know right now it's uh, rental arbitrage is the the shiny object. It's yeah. oh rental arbitrage. You can make all this money. You can double your your note. You can double the lease. Um, but. What people don't realize is, like you were saying, there's those slow seasons. Regulations do change. I mean, you've you've spent the past two years running into obstacle, 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 yeah. and you know it it can impact. Like like what you were saying was Pareto's principle. You know that 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 you know eighty percent of your you know that eighty twenty rule, uh, where that one property could be taking up eighty percent of your time while the other twenty yeah. percent is making you you know, most of the money, this one, right. you know, this one property is, is really just draining you. Um, so yeah. you decided to throw in the co-host model, which is something that we teach on vacation rental machine, uh, where you're able to basically, you know, if your ROI is, let's say, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's going to take you, a, let's say eight months to be able to get your return on investment back. If you have the co-host model in there and you're, you're able to counter that, you can, you can, gradually just kind of level things out so you can make basically yeah. make your ROI uh, a lot sooner. And then at that point, it's like, it's just all profit after that. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. And uh, I think that the, when it comes to those two models, right? What you said, sort of rental arbitrage is a shiny model. I think that's because it's an easier sale when you have no experience. You can go up to a landlord and say, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to take all the risk, but you can't go up to a, a landlord and be like, I don't know what I'm doing take the risk with me. Right. You right, know, right. so, so that's, so it does actually make sense to start with the rental arbitrage model. Maybe on the, like, even if you did a, a one, a one bedroom, right. That's a, a super small risk, but you made sure there was still like, you, maybe you'll make like 2,500, 5,000 throughout the entire year, like nothing. Right. But the thing is, is that, uh, you're going to learn everything from that. Right. My first two homes in Michigan that failed, I learned everything from, I learned enough to be able to raise $250,000. Right. Like, so like, you know, the, the homes failed, but I learned so much to be able to do that. So if you, you could take a, the tiny, like a studio, just in a good area, put barely any money into it, learn every single last thing over like a three month period, and then go to a landlord and be like, look at this is what I know. Like along with, you know, listening to podcasts, like your machine uh, podcast, where they go through, uh, you know, how to do the property management, learn how to do that while doing it at the same time. Then you can go to a landlord and be like, I've already got this one. We're doing it this way. Here's the data. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to put this together. Let's take the response together. And then if the numbers make sense, the landlord's gonna be like, "Yeah, let's go." You know, if you're if you're trying to level out your arbitrage and your co-host, um, how do you, how do you know when you come up to a deal um, if this is something that you should be taking on yourself, or if you should be, uh, you know, working with the landlord or, or investors to be able to turn this into a co-host property? So, uh, it actually so from my experience, it's going to depend on the way that the referral comes to you. 
in the way that you approach somebody. Okay, so uh, perfect example is I, you know, I had a, a, a landlord come to me for the, a, because I was promoting the property management side and his property, I would take on as rental arbitrage. But I came to him with the property management and when you do that, you got to show them all the numbers, right? You got to show them every single last thing. So he sees it, right? So when he sees it, if he goes, well, I'm obviously going to take it, right? Like this is one of those homes where it's going to make a good amount more. So he's like, he's obviously going to take on that risk. Um, I'm okay with it. You know what I mean? Because, because it, it is, you know, we're, we're still making good money. So it is what it is. But uh, there's another example, um, a home actually just, just went for rent directly beside one of my other homes that I had the very first home that I got. It's nicer, but it has one less bath, bath but it's significantly nicer. It's like completely redone. Um, and the, and the rent is $300 cheaper than, uh, what I'm paying on the other one. And I, and so I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, that's a, that's, that's like, it's like a 30, I would say about 30 to 35,000 a year property, uh, profit all rental arbitrage model. So, um, I'm actually a pro I've approached that landlord, saw his rental and reached out to him and said, this is what I, I want to do. Uh, can we, can we talk about it? Right. And so he's been approached before by some idiot <laughs> because the information he had was ridiculous. So we're going to, I'm going to try and walk him through that and like make sense of it. And if it, if it makes sense, then we'll, we'll go the arbitrage model. Right. Um, so it's just a matter of the way that the, they come through. Like if a referral comes through where they're like, Hey, here's the, this guy's going to show you how much property you can do. You gotta go property management. Right. So anyways, I, that's, that's I, I, I love it. And I, lo I love what you said. You, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, walk the landlord through because a lot of people might be coming into the space and they say, I want to turn your property into an Airbnb and make money off of it. And then it just ruins it for that landlord. They're like jaded whenever yeah. a new person comes up to them. They're like, no, this is a legit business. Like, I, yeah, you know, I, I think, yeah. I think that's really great. Um, John, that, happened. <laughs> John that, that, that is so cool. And, uh, definitely, you know, I, I know you're very data driven and, um, you know, I, we were talking before the show about some of the stuff that you have going on. Um, so, uh, you, you're, you're, from all of this research and all the stuff that you've been doing, you, you've kind of been co coming up with um, uh, some some tools to be able to utilize that you can provide to uh, property uh, property managers or uh, to landlords or to your property investors if you are taking on clients. Um, so I, I think it's really cool. I definitely uh, maybe we can get you on another show where we kind of walk through uh, your tool and see see how that works. Um, because uh, some of the stuff that you were saying was like AirDNA, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, all of us, you know, you, uh, professionals that when we are looking at this data, you, you can't just take everything as, as it is. And I think your story, uh, of how you got started and where you are now really shows that it, you know, you can't just base off the numbers. There's other factors that come into the play. And there's also things that you should be presenting to, uh, property investors. If you are taking on management, you know, if you're working with an investor and you're saying it's going to be green all year, but in actuality, it's, it's actually red during certain seasons, or you don't take a deep dive into the numbers, into the listings. There's a lot of things that, that come into play. So, um, this is an exciting time for a lot of new people that are coming into the space. There's a lot of new tools and a lot of new things. Um, so I would definitely like to, uh, get you on to maybe share about, you know, some of the, some of the next moves that are coming into the space. Uh, because, you know, if, if, you know, if, if these things actually do turn out like what, what you say that they are, um, I mean, that, 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 that saves us, uh, a lot and also allows for us to be able to grow our businesses, uh, as professional hosts. Mm -hmm. What's what's the best way that uh, anybody can reach you if they if they want to know where's the best location that they should be investing in because you, you you seem to know. Uh, you can send money to my Venmo and then I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin only, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you know I'll give my uh, I'll give my email because uh, I like uh, I like when people actually reach out to me. If you have uh, if you have a question, if you you need some advice or you want to you want to figure something out. Um, I'll get you, please do. Yeah. Right. So, so I like, I do like to talk to people. I've done this one other time and I did that. And, uh, I, I had a lot of people reach out to me and it was, it was very insightful. And, and I, I found that there was a lot of good connections there. So if you want to reach out to me, my email is oh, I'll, John. I'll, I'll, oh. I'll include it. I'll include it in the show notes. Perfect. Okay. Okay, cool. So he'll include it, reach out to me. <laughs> I'll respond, um, and, and, and give you as much information as I possibly can and, and help you out wherever I can. I but, uh, if, if I were to give one line of advice, um, you make sure that you understand your numbers from the data through and through before ever signing a lease. I've seen too many and talked to too many people who have signed on a lease in a, in a location and a, a unit size that would never make them money, no matter how hard they tried and how well they did. You just, you have to understand that some areas are better as an annual rental and some areas are better as an Airbnb. 
You need to understand that and do not sign a lease unless you understand that. Okay. That's my, that's my line of advice. Everything else comes around it, but that's, that's biggest thing. Okay. Otherwise you're not gonna make money. So. <laughs> All right. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you so much, John. This this has been uh, just a, a, a really impactful episode. We have so much information for people that are coming into the space. Um, you know, it's not it's not all, um, you know, gold and, you know, cash just coming out of the, your ears. I mean, there, there are those seasons. And like you were saying, John, um, you know, d- with those properties that are profitable, you know, you're making like eighteen hundred dollars net is what you're saying per per listing. Yeah. And you have, you know, uh, seven arbitrage listings, three three uh, co-host list things. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of money there, but um, like you were saying throughout this episode, there's, there's those high seasons, there's those low, slow seasons. You have to learn how to be able to take your cash and use it uh, and safeguard it so that you can expand and that you can also protect yourself. Uh, so much good information. Definitely recommend for those of you that are getting into the rental arbitrage or co-hosting space, take a listen to this episode again um, and, and really, you know, let this sink in because these are the risks that are involved in this business. Um, so if you want to grow and scale a uh, profitable vacation rental machine, then uh, you definitely want to uh, heed, heed John's uh, tips in this episode. But uh, thank you so much, John. And until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. Hope you host benefited from the show. If you found value, please go on over to iTunes, leave us a review, and let us know what you enjoy about the show. If you'd like to talk to hosts that have been featured in these episodes, as well as the community, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation. 